Good morning. Well, my topic this morning comes from, I've been assigned Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Talk about the fall of Babylon. Before we do that, let's, let's pray this morning. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we do praise you today. Lord, we are grateful for each and every opportunity you've given us, Lord, to uh, have the fellowship of the saints. Lord, we're thankful for the camp. We're thankful for our brothers and sisters and the encouragement that we receive from one another. Lord, I pray that as we go through uh, this passage, Lord, that we'll receive encouragement, the encouragement that you want us to have, Lord, to... to uh, Heed the warnings, Lord, to rejoice in the things that we're to rejoice in, and Lord, to heed the call of the apocalypse. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read uh, Revelation 17. We're going to start in verse 1. Revelation 17, verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had seen the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here. I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns, the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with the gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, A mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast and that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings, five fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes he must remain a little while. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. These will wage war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are the called and the chosen and the faithful. And He said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, and the ten horns which you saw in the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman who you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. What is Babylon the Great? What, what is Babylon? Um, the, to answer that, let's, um, let's start to, you know, one of its references is a, is a city. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Verse 1, Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And it came about as they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. 
and they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city, a tower whose top will reach the heaven and let us make ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the whole face of the earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they begin to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. The Lord scattered them from abroad from there over the whole face of the earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. At Babel, Babylon, they, they have forgotten or paid no attention to what was handed down from the record of the fall, from, from Adam and Eve, from the flood, from prior to that, with the things that perhaps they had been handed down from Enoch, and they decided that they wanted to make a name for themselves, to build a tower that would ascend to heaven, all the way to heaven, to put themselves in the place of God, man as the center. Let's flip on, fast forward to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar had a, had a dream, and Daniel is explaining it. I'm just going to pick up towards the end of, that, of his explanation. Uh, just pick up in verse 25. He said that you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place be with the beast of the field, and you be given grass to eat like cattle, and be drenched with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. And that in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be prolonging of your prosperity. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon. The king reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power, and for the glory of my majesty. And while the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. And then he gets his judgment. But Nebuchadnezzar says, Babylon the Great, this is Babylon the Great, which I have built by the might of my power, for the glory of my majesty, his ascendancy. It's all about him. It's all about man. It's all about pleasing himself. Let's do one more prophet. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. And then we'll get back to Revelation. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 4, that you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon, the king of Babylon, and say, how the oppressor has ceased and how fury has ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers. And we're going we're gonna to skip through a little bit of the taunt and we'll just pick up at verse 11. Your pomp and the music of your harps have been brought down to Sheol. Maggots are spread out as your bed beneath, and worms are your covering. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who weakened the nations. But you said into your heart, I will ascend to heaven. 
I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol to the recesses of the pit. Now the, the, the king of, uh, of Babel, it was that Nimrod, led a group of people wanted to, to ascend, to put themselves in the place of God. Nebuchadnezzar, by his might, by his power, by his majesty of his kingdom, wanted to put him in place and serve himself. And I wonder where they got that. From the king of Babylon. So when I'm trying to sort through and figure out what is Babylon, you know, what we read in Revelation 17 at the end said, in verse 18, the woman you saw is the great city which reigns over the king of the earth. And let's flip over, and I won't spend whoever's got Revelation 21 much time there. And Luke brought this out last night. Revelation 21, 2. I'm trying to sort this out. I, I, I seem to remember that there is another woman and there is another city. In verse 2, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. There's a city, the New Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly city. And there's a woman, the bride, and when I look at the contrast of what, uh, from the true bride and the heavenly city, there's an earthly city, a worldly city, and a worldly woman. Babylon the Great. Two women, two cities. So if Babylon, or excuse me, if the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, and the bride is the bride, make up the church, and I'm trying to deduce, well, if that's the church. What can this be? It seems like the world and worldliness. Um, you know, when Jesus was tempted by Satan, uh, he was given all the he said, um, all the kingdoms of the world. In a moment of time, if you put the two accounts together, Matthew and Luke, in a moment of time, I'll show you all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. It's Babylon. It's, it's the glory of this world. It's, it's everything that this world has to offer. Um, Satan in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, we won't go there, but it says, he is the God of this world. The king of Babylon, he is the God of this world. As Mike, in his overview, uh, I think he referred to it as the seduction of the world. And that's, a, and that's a good description. Worldliness, the glory of the world. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Paul's just giving him a great, encouraging uh, message and picture of victory. And then he drops down in verse 17 and says... Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I have often told you and now tell you even weeping, they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await a Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul is explaining, hey... Uh, our citizenship is in heaven. But, but there's some, their, their minds aren't there. They're not, uh, somebody else mentioned dwelling. Uh, where are you dwelling? They're not dwelling in heaven. They're, they've set their minds on earthly things, walking in Babylon. Satan, however you want to describe Satan, the dragon, the king of Babylon, he wants our set, minds set on earthly things things below. Babylon is not passive. From our scripture, 
Uh, that's quite a description. Go back to chapter 17. in verse 1 come here I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters and then describe in verse 3 it carried me away in the spirit and wilderness and I saw the woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names having seven heads and ten horns the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a cup full of abominations and the unclean things of her immorality and she is seductive. You know, the, the city's not waiting just for somebody to walk in. There's seduction. It's pulling. The pull. Proverbs bring this out actually in several places. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 6. My son, keep my words and my treasure, my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live, and my teaching is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your intimate friends. They may keep you from an adult, that they may keep you from an adulteress, from the foreigner who flattens, flatters with her words. Flattens too. For at the window of my house, I looked out through the lattice, and I saw among the naive, the discerned and discerned among the youth, a young man lacking sense, passing through the street near her corner. And he takes the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness. And behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. She is boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the squares, and lurks by every corner. And so she seizes him and kisses him. And with a brazen face, she says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings. Today I have paid my vows. Therefore I come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with the coverings, with the colored linens of Egypt, I have sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us drink the, our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses. For my husband is not home. He's gone on a journey. He has taken a bag of money with him. And the full moon, at the full moon he will come home. And with her many persuasions she entices him. With her flattering lips she seduces him. Suddenly he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter. Or as one in fetters the discipline of a fool, until the arrow pierces through his liver as a bird hastens to the snare, so he does not know that it will cost him his life. She's a seductress. Babylon. Babylon is aggressive. She's alluring. Well, what's in Babylon? What does Babylon have to offer? You know, sometimes um, I'll, I'll read... Some of the Psalms and the Scriptures and, you know, what, uh, what can man do to me? And we know in the reference of faith, there's nothing that man can do. But when you walk by the flesh and you're at, in this temporal world, you think, actually, it's quite a lot what man can do. Man's pretty, man's pretty wretched. There, there's, there's the depths of the depravity and what it can do. And for those, those walking by faith, uh, what does... What does Babylon have to offer? Well, well, nothing. But walking by the flesh, Babylon has a lot to offer. Everything you could possibly want in this world, the seduction of the world, to keep our mind and keep us grounded on the things of this earth rather than from above. Luke brought out a lot of them last night. Immorality, pornography, Anything at your fingertips, right? He brought that out. Luxury, every material thing. And we are, we are a rich people. And we, we have, uh, we, there's, we don't go without. We don't go in need. Luxury, everything we can need. Let's go uh, over to Revelation 18 for a second.
You want it, you got it. Bright lights, big city. Verse 18. Picking up in one of the, one of the, the pictures of the judgment, and we'll just kind of cut it in the middle, describing uh, what, what the merchants, you know, they're, they're, uh, have their woes because nobody's buying anymore once, once it's judged. But cargoes of gold, verse 12, and silver, precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and the cattle and sheep and cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves and human lives. The fruit you long for has gone from you. All the things which were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you and men will no longer find them. Everything you could possibly want Babylon has to offer. It said, trades even in slaves and human lives. And Babylon, it, it's all about the merchants, who's getting rich. It's about who the, who the harlot is trading with and trafficking with, um, with no, no consideration even up to human lives. Slaves, whether it's trafficking in the, the, the sex trafficking that we see now, it's, it's all there, all there in Babylon. What's in Babylon? There's entertainment. What else to, to keep us in this world? Wealth. Everything that directs our attention toward this world. Um, I'm not going to spend much time going through and talking about the beast. I think uh, I was talking with um, um, who's got chapter 13. Davis. Yeah, I was Davis. I was talking with Davis, um, and he's going through he's going through the beast. But you know, it says that he's a, Babylon is a harlot, and she committed immorality with the kings of the earth. Um, working with all the successive kingdoms throughout the ages to, to put forth and oppress the church, the waging war with the woman and her children, the true woman and her children, governments working with Babylon. For instance, if uh, all things according to the flesh in Babylon, if uh, working with governments, if, if they're trying to put out, Babylon says everything goes, and in the homosexual agenda and the trans agenda, working with, working with the success of the kingdoms of this world, working with government hand in hand, putting that in the, in the school system, working even with the merchants and the corporations. You watch, uh, anybody watching the Olympics? I, I didn't, but I sure heard about the opening ceremonies um, all working hand in hand. Everything you could want, according to the flesh, in Babylon, working against the church and the true woman and her children, working to put enmity between us and God. Friendship with the world is enmity toward God. But what's God's message regarding Babylon? Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. And in here, there's four pictures, as best I can tell. Um, the, there's, there's from, from four different perspectives. Um, and starting in chapter 17, verse 1, uh, one of the seven angels, one of the ones who had uh, one of the seven bowls, and it, he says, I'll show you the judge, or the angel says, I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot. And he speaks throughout verse 18 and, and gives a picture from 14 to 18 about judgment. Then another one picks up. It says, after these things in verse 18, uh, and I'll start there. Verse 1, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. 
She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine and the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. Babylon the Great, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. That's the judgment. Babylon is going to be desolate. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 13. Nothing going to be there but become a dwelling place, as it said, for demons, unclean spirits, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. Isaiah chapter 13. We'll pick up in verse 17. Behold, I'm going to stir up the Medes against them who will not value silver or take pleasure in gold, and their bows will mow down the young men. They will not even have compassion on the fruit of the womb. Nor will, they eye pity, nor will their eye pity children. And Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation. Nor will the Arab pitch his tent there, nor will the shepherds make their flocks lie down there, but desert creatures will lie down there. And their houses will be full of owls. Ostriches will also live there. And shaggy goats will frolic, frolic there. Hyenas will howl in their fortified towers. And jackals in their luxurious palaces. Her fateful time also will soon come. And her days will not be prolonged. That was the judgment against Babylon. And that judgment took place in, in Babylon, the physical city. Over time, that's exactly what Babylon has become. A place uh, where hyenas howl, the jackals. Uh, it's, it's desolate. There's nothing left of Babylon. And it's the picture he gives up. He, he destroyed the Babylon, the, the, the city of Babylon. And that's just our assurance, the picture he gives us, that spiritual Babylon is coming down. He picks up again verse 4, and another voice from heaven comes and says, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she said as it has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her to the degree that she has glorified herself and lives sensuously to the same degree give her torment and mourning for she says in her heart I sit as queen and I am not a widow and I will never see mourning for this reason in one day her plagues will come pestilence and mourning and famine and she will be burned up with fire for the Lord God who judges her is strong it says, I sit as queen and I am not a widow. I will never see mourning. Let's go to Isaiah 47. The king of Babylon is going to ascend the heavens. And he says, her sins have piled up as high as heavens. And he's remembered him. And he's paying him back double. Isaiah 47. Verse 1, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no longer be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind the meal. Remove your veil, strip off the skirt, uncover the legs, cross the rivers. Your nakedness will be uncovered. Your shame also will be exposed. Take vengeance and will not spare a man. Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is His name, the Holy One of Israel, Sit silent and go into the darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you will no longer be called the queen of kingdoms. I was angry with my people. I profaned my heritage. I gave them into your hand. You did not show mercy to them. On the aged you made your yoke heavy. Yet you said, I will become queen forever. These things you did not consider, nor remember the outcome of them. 
Now hear this, you sensual one who dwells securely, who says in your heart, I am and there is no one besides me. I will not sit as a widow nor no loss of children. But these two things will come on you suddenly in one day, loss of children and widowhood. They will come on you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries, in spite of the great power of your spells. You felt, the secure, you felt secure in your wickedness and said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge, they have deluded you. For you said in your heart, I am and there is no one besides me. Same picture. Babylon is coming down. The phys physical Babylon we prophesied it and it came to pass. Spiritual Babylon is coming down. Third picture. Actually, the fourth. Verse 21. Then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. And the sound of harpists and, museum, and mus musicians and flute players and the trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer, and no craftsman or any craft will be found in you any longer, and the sound of the mill will not be heard in you any longer, and the light of the lamp will not shine in you any longer, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who have been slain on the earth. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 51. Verse 61, Then Jeremiah said to Sariah, As soon as you come to Babylon... Then see that you read all these words aloud and say, You, O Lord, have promised concerning this place to cut it off, so there will be nothing dwelling in it, whether man or beast, but it will be a perpetual desolation. And as soon as you finish reading this scroll, you will tie it up and throw it into the middle of the Euphrates and say, Just so shall Babylon sink down and not rise again because of the calamity that I am going to bring on her, and they will become exhausted. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. Same, different description, but same picture. Babylon, physical Babylon came down, prophesied and came down. Spiritual Babylon is coming down. Now that first one, I, I hit three of the four. That first one, uh, I'm not as confident in that picture. But... This is my idea, the, my opinion, I'll, I'll tell you that. In verse 14 of chapter 17, these will wage war with the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and those who are with Him are the called and the chosen and the faithful. And He said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. He said the, the ten horns which you saw and the beast, they'll hate the harlot. They'll, these are the ones that worked with her. And, and they'll desolate, they'll make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn up. That's, that's judgment on Babylon again. But over in 18, verse 9, those, those kings, the ones who committed acts of immorality, they, um, they'll weep and lament when they see the smoke of her burning. I, I, I picture similar to at the end of 16 when Nolan was bringing out, you know, even as the hailstones were, were falling down, they're shaking their fist at God, blaspheming God. 
if they're, if they're shaking their fist at God, perhaps they're also shaking their fist and doing more against the harlot, against Babylon, who seduced them, who, who tricked them. It says, or in verse uh, 23, for your merchants were the great men of the earth because all the nations were deceived, talking about Babylon, by your sorcery. That the curtain has been pulled back, been exposed for the fraud that it is. That, that what was to give, everything that was needed, everything that could be desired, everything you want in this life, in the end, was death. Exposed for what it is. Now, what's... What's the message? What's the call of the apocalypse from speaking of Babylon? I think it's in verse 4 of 18. He said, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive the plagues. Come out. Come out of Babylon. We had the church of Laodicea yesterday. Uh, I think, I think that was a call to come out of Babylon. They said, I am, I am rich. I am wealthy. I have need of nothing. I'm quite comfortable here in Babylon, in this earth. Come out. The, the church of Laodicea was, was actually poor, blind, and naked. How about, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Our mouth is spoken freely to you, O Corinthians, and our heart is open wide. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your affections. Now in like exchange, I speak as to children, open wide to us also. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God has said, I dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. That's coming from Isaiah 52, if I'm reading that correctly. That's when they're coming back from, from exile. It says, And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me. Come out. He didn't want us trafficking with Babylon. He wants us out. Um, Luke talked last night um, you know, about Satan's tactics. Uh, what, what, what he does. What he knows about us. Um, social media. He talked a little bit about social media. You know, I... I find it amazing when I go on, and uh, I don't do much with Facebook. I still have my account and, and, and see what's up, but um, I, I do more Twitter. Um, uh, just I picked that up a couple years ago just for, to follow some news things, and um, boy, it's amazing. Uh, you, you hover over one thing, you, you, you click on one thing, and, and what it says suggests for you and it's amazing they build a file on you um, yeah mark zuckerberg sure knows about you elon musk sure knows about you about me what what do you think you think satan's got a file you think, you think he knows uh, luke uh, let, let's go back to joe luke brought this out um, let's go back to joe real quick Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? 
He said, well, first of all, he said, have you considered my servant Job? Obviously, he had. But he didn't just affirm that that Job was a blameless and upright man. He had his own file on him. He said, does Job fear God for nothing? You have... Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. He knew all about Job. He, he had his own book, his own file. He, he's got one on us. When I worked, uh, I worked as a service manager uh, people that some people might find this hard to believe because people that know me know I don't know anything about cars. Uh, but I, I worked as a service manager at a Honda dealership back in the early 90s. Um, a friend of mine said, "Hey, Mike, I was um, I was in between jobs, as they say." Um, and he said, "Hey, Mike, you got to come. You got to come apply at the service department." I said, "Look, Chuck, I don't know anything about cars." And he goes, "Mike, I'm telling you." If you don't take this job, they're going to give it to Loopy the Clown. And I just kind of laughed it off. And he said, no, seriously. Loopy the Clown applied for this job. you gotta, you got to apply for it. But Loopy just did weekend uh, birthday parties for kids and things like that. But he was between jobs, too. And so I did. And, and I got the job. Um, and they sent me to, to sales school down in, in Richmond, Virginia at, at uh, I don't even remember what, what it, where it was held, uh, what, if it was at a dealership, but anyway. Um, and we're going through the sales training, and he said, look, he said, Mike, he asked me a question, picked me out, and he said, so if you're gonna, if you're gonna sell somebody a timing belt, you've got, and this, remember, this was 1991, uh, you've got somebody with an 85 Accord, and they come into your shop with 65,000 miles on it, and you look at the records, they've never had a timing belt. And you ask them, hey, have you ever had the timing belt replaced in this thing? Um, and, and he said, so how are you going to sell them? How are you going to get them to cough over back then? I know this was 1991, the $200 to replace the timing belt. And uh, I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them about the benefits of, of replacing the timing belt. He said, well, that's good. You need to do that. He said, but, but before you do that, he said, you got to whiff them. And I said, Come again? He said, you, you got to whiff them. He said, it's W-I-I-F-M. So you got to answer this question that they're asking. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? Because see, if you've, got, if you've got a grandma with three grandchildren, the what's in it for her is her safety. When that timing belt goes on an 85 Accord, most cars, it, it leaves you, I didn't know that much about cars. Um, it leaves you wherever that timing belt breaks. Yeah. So the grandma doesn't want to be left on the road. You're selling safety. That's what's in it for her. For the, for the 45-year-old salesman um, who, who lives out of that car, your, safety is, is not the primary issue. It's that when that timing belt breaks, it bends the valves. And that $200 repair just turned into thousands of dollars of repairs. He said, you're selling him on the value, on the economy, on the, on the savings. He said, man, you got to whiff him. Satan knows how to whiff him, how to keep folks and get them trafficking back within, within that chain, in that area, and keeping, their, keeping them grounded in this earth, in the things of this world. You know, again, it was brought out last night all the things where he knows, he knows what's in it for you. He knows what, where your weak spots are, where my weak spots are, where, where the temptation areas are. Um, Luke brought out that, man, if you want, if, 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 if you want to drink, boy, there's opportunities everywhere you go. I'll tell you, if you want to smoke weed, there's opportunities everywhere you go. I, we got we rented an Airbnb out way past Three Forks because, man, Bozeman's getting crazy. And we're out in the middle of nowhere. And, and there's literally a, one of those storage sheds, that prefab storage sheds that you can buy, um, well, for a few thousand bucks anyway. That's all it is, a storage shed. And it's sitting down this gravel road, or what looks to be a gravel road, out in the middle of the field, and it's a weed shack. 
You don't get it anywhere. Anywhere. You know, Satan knows. <coughs> Satan knows. Oh. Pornography. Man, it's everywhere. It's not just, it's not just the, the young boys with curiosity. It's the married guys. It's the grandpas. Satan knows. Alcohol, boy, we could go on and on. And I know that's just the low-hanging fruit. But anything to draw into this world and to keep folks in Babylon. Don't mess around with it. But sometimes, sometimes I think, and especially in a group like this, and I'm not naive, I, I, I know there's, there's all kinds of struggles. But distraction. Distraction with things that aren't necessarily bad. Um, Colossians chapter 3, we, we all know this. When you set your mind on things above, where Christ is, see the right hand of God. But why does he write that? Not, not on things of the earth. Because there's a tendency to be dra- distracted to the things of the earth. You know, I, uh, we're, we're planning a, a beach trip. Uh, or have planned it. We're, it should be going here, in a, or will in just a few weeks. And um, we're trying to sort through. Uh, we're meeting up with Ashley and Brandon, our, our daughter and son-in-law, and their five kids. And several of us are coming out from Montana, and and meeting up with them, and, um, and heading to Florida. And we're uh, over around Pensacola. I've never been on that side of the state, but just looking at flights. There's, I couldn't find any good airports, big airports around there. Um, so everything's like two and three stops and overnights. So I'm trying to figure out a, a decent flight. So I started looking around at Atlanta. And then you know, I'm scrolling Twitter. and well, JMU football appears. I don't know why they would target me for that. <laughs> um, and lo and behold, James Madison on September 20, whatever it is, second or third, is playing at the University of North Carolina. And so I pitched this to Becky. I said, <laughs> we, could, we could fly into Raleigh, rent a car in Raleigh, drive to Chapel Hill, take in the game, and then we could drive the 11 hours <laughs> to Pensacola. And uh, that's, a, that's a big game. University of North Carolina. And, uh, and believe it or not, she was like, okay, that'd be fun. No kidding. And um, I was like, well, that was easy. <laughs> and, uh, and so I got to got to thinking about that and um, still working on flights and things and uh, and then a, a, I don't know it may have been a week or so later and uh, about the time I got this text for family camp actually and uh, she goes what did you decide about um, and, and I I got her permission to, to share this um, I don't always <laughs> But um, I said, what did you decide? And I said, well, um, you know, still, still looking at things and uh, trying to sort that out. And she goes, well, you know, I, um, I would love to go to that game with you. And she said, I, I would have a fantastic time. And if you've ever been to any sporting event with Becky, you know she does have a fantastic time. <laughs> um, and she goes, I'd have, I'd have a fantastic time. She goes, but can I share something with you? This is her talking. I'm not saying can I share something with you guys. She, goes, um, she said, can I share something with you? And I said, yeah, sure. And uh, she goes, no, I, I will have a great time at that game. I would love to go. She goes, but my concern is that you give too much of yourself to sports. And, um, and she said, um, you know, I think I, I'm concerned that when I do that, it's, 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 
she said it much more eloquently than this, but it's more like I'm, I'm, I'm blessing this whole season because then once that game, there's every other college football game, there's every other JMU game, there's Saturday college football, there's Sunday afternoon football, there's hunting season, there's World Series, there's Super Bowl, then there's March Madness, then there's church softball, and again, she said it much more kindly, and, but I got the, and, um, and so I didn't say much. Right? Sometimes, you know, uh, discipline comes in many forms from the Lord. And, um, and, it's, and it's not, um, it's not enjoyable. And but that's all I thought about it. Uh, and, uh, and I decided that, you know, we're, 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 I got this message. I'm like, man, the seduction of Babylon. Anything and everything that Satan can use to keep your mind focused on this earth. Guys, I'm, Becky is not trying to make me a teetotaler against football, and I'm not trying to, 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 to put those ideas in your head, so don't, don't worry. You can ask me what the JMU score was after we're done here. Um, but listen, man, you can't, it's not just males. You can't multitask. You, you, you cannot keep your eyes set and focused on two different things at one time. So when you're focusing on one, when you're giving yourself your energy, your time, your resources to one thing, you're denying another. It's just a fact. It has to be. That's the way it is. And with distraction in whatever form it can be, whichever one you're tempted with may be completely different than the ones I'm tempted with. That fact remains. When you focused on one, something has to give. And when whatever that distraction is and whatever takes your time and your energy, if, if it competes with the kingdom, if it competes with Jesus, then that other thing is what's becoming bigger and Jesus is becoming smaller. Flip side, so we want to heed that call and stay out of Babylon. Keep our minds where they go and our actions to follow. We gotta make him bigger. He's gotta get bigger. We we have to be able to see him to take out all the other things that are distracting and clouding. As Mark tar talked about, uh, Mark Souter talked about, you know, the clouds, man, and when they went away, glacier was whew. we control some of those clouds when it comes with our view of Jesus. Let's get rid of them. Let's take out the distractions in whatever form that they are. You know, there's, there's lots of things we could say in things of keeping the things of the world and worldliness out. But get rid of the distractions. For what purpose? I like... With, I think 1 Peter chapter 4 will, will apply and given this context and the call come out of Babylon. 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For the time is already past. It's sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them in the same excess of dissipation. They malign you, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached, even to those who are dead, that those who are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the Spirit according to the will of God. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment, sober in spirit, for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, 
because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. My will must decrease and my view of him and his will must increase. Thank you.